Ever felt lost on a landscape shoot despite being surrounded by breathtaking views? Or maybe when you look back at your photos from a trip, they don't match the beauty you witnessed in person? I've been there. That feeling of missing out on the perfect shot or not knowing where to even begin, it's frustrating. But what if instead you could reliably arrive when the conditions are right, already know some hidden spots you want to explore, and have a head start on capturing your vision? Often it simply comes down to proper planning. And in this video, I'm sharing five powerful apps that have transformed how I plan my photography trips, helping me make the most of my precious time in nature. I'll show each app's best features to maximize your chances of capturing epic landscape photos. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting your landscape photography journey, I'm confident you'll walk away with at least one tip to overcome your frustrations and transform your results. And let's face it, landscape photography has its share of frustrations. Anyone else feel like there's never enough time to photograph everything? Or maybe you're just not sure where to even focus your attention in the vast landscape. Do you go wide and grand? Do you go small and detailed? I've had so many of those types of moments. And that's why I've come to realize that landscape photography, like much of life, is about balance. Yes, landscape photography is unpredictable. The weather, the light, seasonal flux, tourists walking through the scene, it's all part of the thrill, of course. But over time, I've learned that the more I can plan ahead of time, the better my chances of capturing those amazing moments. With a bit of planning, we can maximize our time so we're in the right place at the right moment, know what gear to bring and how to get the best spots without wasting energy, have a good vision for the types of images we might make, and even discover hidden gems you never knew existed. Of course, it's worth noting that we don't always need an in-depth plan. There's something fun and freeing about spontaneously responding to whatever nature provides. After all, some of my best shots have come from those unexpected moments. But as good old Ben Franklin opined, failing to plan is planning to fail. And James Clear echoed this in his Atomic Habits when he states, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems or planning. The point is that success doesn't usually happen by accident. Even with spontaneity and flexibility, planning the things we can control gives us the best chance of capturing those amazing moments. And I learned the hard way that it's not just about missed shots. A few years ago, I saw snapshots of a hidden waterfall on a Facebook group. So without much of a plan, I set off with my camera. Shortly after entering what appeared to be the densest forest in all the Pacific Northwest, I ended up on a faint trail lured by the tempting sound of water. But an hour or so in, there was no waterfall in sight, only its sound mocking me. And the brush was thick. Devil's Club, a Pacific Northwest special, it was tearing at my clothes and my skin, rips in my socks and the thick canopy rendered my GPS completely useless. And before I knew it, I was cliffed out uh, with no safe way down to the falls. No cell service, the sun was dipping low in the sky, my water was nearly gone because I barely brought any. I started to panic. Finally, after collecting myself, I eventually managed to retrace my steps to my car, exhausted, frustrated. And I learned a crucial lesson, how a lack of planning could jeopardize more than just my photography. It pushed me to seek out the best tools to maximize my time and safety in nature. Over the years, I've tried lots of apps and I've found a few that work really well and changed how I plan my photo trips. And I wanna share them with you. Starting with app number one, if you've ever gone hiking, you've probably used all trails. Ultrails is great for reading trip reports, seeing if an area is accessible, and getting to the right trailhead. You always carry paper map backups, right? Let's say we want to take a trip to Olympic National Park. The first thing that's really nice about Ultrails are these curated guides that they put together with select hikes. So we can click on one of those, and it gives us a nice summary along with times to visit. So if this is your first time, you might want to stay within this window. Uh, much of the photography is actually really nice outside of this window. And then a few select hikes. So let's just click on one of these to dive in. One of the first really good features that I want to call out is the preview trail. Click on this. 
and this toggles into the map view and then flips on the satellite layer as well as the 3D layer and allows us to essentially walk the path. You can pause and play using the space bar and you can use control to uh, orient the view. So for example, if you wanted to see what the view was like, as we first crest the ridge, you could pause here, zoom out a little bit, and then use control, spin around here to see what that view might be like, go up and down. So this is a really nice feature. So let's get out of this. So let's say we're not sold on this hike, but we want to look at other hikes within Olympic National Park. If you want to see filters within a specific area, you click on the map view. And then from here, this is what really makes All Trails a special app are these, uh, these filters up here. And so there are 164 official trails within the All Trails Olympic Park uh, system. And so I usually click up here to more filters and um, play with these to my heart's content. So let's find something with views and maybe we don't want that much elevation gain. I love the loop hike feature. Maybe we only want a rating of four and above. And this is one of my favorite features, being able to see hikes, especially on weekends or during prime season, uh, being able to filter for hikes that are a little bit less popular. This highest point is also very nice. It's something that helps when we're dealing with snow conditions. For instance, if we know that the snow line is at 5,000 or 6,000 feet, we might choose to stay below that. Or perhaps if we want a snowshoe, maybe we purposely choose something above it. So that's a really nice feature. Okay. And then of course you still have all these sorting and by difficulty, length, activity, it's really wonderful. Let's clear these for now and just peruse the list. Okay, so let's say Hurricane Hill is something I've heard of, I've always wanted to do. We click on that. The general information is here is 3.4 miles, um, but it is April and there's a chance that there's still snow on the road. Perhaps I haven't been here before. So what makes all trails really great, first of all, is um, the reviews, right? So we can come down here and read reviews. So it looks like this one's old. And here, just on our second review, we learned that you need to hike a little bit further than um, than the normal hike when it's when there's when it's snow free, and so this is good information. This was relatively recent, seems doable, but perhaps uh, we're bringing snowshoes. So normally, what would happen is if you uh, download the the map on your mobile app. So if you were to have this pulled up on your on uh, iOS or Android app and and download the map, it's going to download the normal. Uh, prime time map. But what's really, really nice and often missed is that if you click into the view trail details, uh, the first thing I love about this is this new little uh, AI summary of the recent reviews. So it tries to summarize the most recent reviews to so you don't have to go scanning through hundreds of them, which is really nice. So we have uh, up to five feet of snow in some areas as of mid April. So it's great information. But the other really nice thing about this is that we see pictures, right? So um, you can also go to photos here and instead of the all trails soar, you can choose newest first. Sometimes that changes it. And we can see here that we have snow conditions up there. Um, you also can see if people are wearing snowshoes or skis. Um, so it seems like it's kind of a mixed conditions. So this is all really great information. Let's go back. So also under trip details is this tab for activities. And this is the one that allows you to download maps that were recorded by individuals rather than the default map. So we can see here, there is a map from April 24th, 2024. And it looks like it's starting and stopping from the same place. looks like a good map. And you'll notice that this is significantly longer than the standard hikes. We have five and a half miles versus the 3.4 or whatnot. Uh, we have another one here. So it looks like this one's three miles. So that's interesting, six miles. So one of the great things about this is you can go ahead and click on this and actually download it. So you can download this route and we'll go ahead and do that. We'll download this as a KML. So now we have a up-to-date GPS track from somebody who successfully made it, which is really nice.
and I like to export it here on my desktop so that I can visualize it in other apps. Trip reports and downloadable tracks are key, but I often wish I could visualize the landscape beforehand, see how the mountains, valleys, and potential viewpoints line up. Well, there's an app that lets you do exactly that. Google Earth, you've probably all played with it, but I wanna share a couple standout features that every landscape photographer should know. With Google Earth open, the first thing we wanna do is set up a few settings. First, make sure that your borders and labels are turned on in the layers panel and zoom in on the area that you want to explore or that you typically explore. And so for me, that's here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm gonna go up to view, make this my start location. Now, every time I open up Google Earth, this is the view I'll be brought to. The next thing I like to turn on is the map scale. So you get that by going up to the view menu and then down to scale legend. And that brings up this little nice scale uh, down here in the bottom left. And as you zoom in into a specific area, it'll give you the distance for uh, that scale, which is really, really nice. Now let's talk about the important layers to have turned on the most important of which is terrain. Terrain will allow us to see our landscape in 3D. So without that turned on, you won't see it. The other ones that I like to have turned on are borders and labels, places, photos, roads you can turn on and off. It can get a little bit busy when you're zoomed out. Under uh, 3D buildings, uh, make sure that both are turned on if you want to see trees in 3D as well. And then under gallery, I don't turn on any of these. These make it hard to see. Under more, what I do like to see is the water body outlines. Parks and recreation areas can be nice, but it muddies up the map. Water body outlines is nice. Let's zoom out. And you'll see here that there's a blue outline around all the water bodies. Toggle that on and off. To have turned on in the settings. So if you get a mountain peak in view and you go up to preferences, slide that over here. Under elevation exaggeration, I like to turn it to something like 1.5. That'll make seeing mountain peaks a lot easier. Click apply and Google will re-render this a little bit higher. It can get kind of ridiculous if you go up to something like three. And now it looks like we're in Patagonia. Again, 1.5 or so is what I like. And it helps me be able to see the peaks a little bit more clearly as I'm navigating around. Now let's go ahead and import that KML file that we downloaded from All Trails. I'll do that by double clicking on the file and it'll open up in Google Earth. As you can see, Google Earth imported the file and directly flew to that area. What's nice is that we toggled on the photos layer. So we see photos that Google has in Google Earth uh, all on the route. With our hike imported, I like to zoom in at the ground level. So you can do that by dragging this little man icon down. And Google Earth may go into the photo mode, which is really nice because it's a 360 photo uh, showing your trail right through it. But if you just wanna see the uh, simulated view, you can just click on this and you're brought back out. And this is what makes Google Earth a much better tool than just staying in all trails for photography. Toggle the sun slider, it's the time of day slider. Uh, that'll bring up a, a time and date toggle. And so this is great because you can reach out into the future, uh, but most importantly, you can change the time throughout the day. So as we click forward here, it's gonna show you what is gonna happen with the landscape as the sun goes down. And so now we're at sunset, and it'll even show you the stars and then sunrise on the following day. I find that this is a much more visually impactful way to see where the sun will be rather than using something like photo pills or photo ephemeris. Now, sometimes the imagery that you're seeing isn't great for whatever reason. It could be the time of the year that it was taken and you just wanna see what it looks like at different times. Google is constantly adding new imagery 
And so if you click on either here or here, it'll bring up historical imagery. And uh, if you go all the way back to 1985, it's gonna be quite pixelated. But as we bring it forward in time, you can see different views. So sometimes this is better, it's a, it was just taken at a better time of the day, it's more useful. And just click through and you'll notice that you get different renditions. Another reason why Google Earth is better than all trails is the navigation. You can move yourself, pan yourself, tilt yourself to get the view. You can hold command and drag to pan while keeping yourself in one location. You can hold shift and move yourself left and right or up and down in the Z index. And you can use your scroll wheel to zoom in and zoom out. When you zoom out and zoom in, it automatically tilts if you have that set up in the settings. You can also hold the command and use your scroll wheel to do a fly around. So if I wanted to fly around Mount Fairchild, I could do that here just by holding down the command on Mac and using my scroll wheel. Another great feature of Google Earth is being able to use the measurement tools. You click here. I like to use the path tool and toggle on show elevation profile. And now if uh, you click along a route, it will start to build an elevation profile for you. Let me just, we can go ahead and walk this ridge and see what the elevation profile is, as well as the distance to make sure that this is doable. You can go ahead and save that path, which you could export to your navigation app of choice. You can also add waypoints by clicking on this thumbtack. So what I often do is uh, find an interesting vantage point and then save that vantage along with the GPS coordinates. So we could say this is a good comp potential. And now you can export this by saving it out. So you can save place as so let's say we really want to plan out this potential shooting location. So the first thing I'll do is I'll use this man to put myself in this place. And next thing I would do would be to turn on the sun time and date slider and toggle through. But the Milky Way is gonna come out. So if you're willing to come up here in the middle of the night, you could catch this just before sunrise. Okay, get out of that. Now, even with Google's water body outlines turned on, it doesn't catch all of the streams and canals that might be waterfalls in our landscape. And so that's where I have an additional layer that I imported. And you'll notice when we toggle that on and off, you have all these blue lines that show up and this has given us an idea of the rivers, streams, waterfalls, creeks, and it is extremely helpful for understanding if you have any water crossings and to understand where there might be some hidden waterfalls. Another feature I find really helpful is the ability to import different field of views so that you get an idea of what it'll look like for your lens and camera combination. So on a full frame camera, I can simulate a 24 millimeter view by clicking on this and then hitting snapshot view. And so this is like a pretty good focal length for this entire scene, including some of the foreground. If instead I want to focus a little bit more on the peak, I can select the 50 millimeter view, zoom up a little bit, And this will give you a rough idea of what would be included at that focal lens. This is a great way to figure out, especially for these scrambles up to peaks, which lenses you can leave behind and which are worth taking. If you're interested in learning more about these layers, how to import them, where to get them, and how to use them for your photography, let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to do a future video. Google Earth is amazing, but when I'm out in the backcountry, I need even more detailed maps. 
the ability to mark spots off trail, add image inspiration, and the ability to download it all. There's a powerful app I use to combine it all in one place. What separates Gaia from all trails? Downloadable areas, overlays, and layers. Okay, now we are in Gaia Maps. And the reason why this is now the third map app that we are looking at is because this is where it all comes together. We have the ability to take all of the work that we've done and take it with us, download it to our device with or without cell phone service. And it's more than just one trip. You can have your entire library of spots uh, visible. And the great thing is all of the overlays and layers allow you to customize the map for each trip in a unique way. So let's start off first by looking at layers. And layers are really amazing. There are actually a ton more layers. If you go to the add map layers, there are so many different layers. And I've gone through and picked out my favorite. And now there are ones that are sort of transparent and it works just like a Photoshop layer in that uh, if it has a transparent aspect, you can see through it. And so things like, um, I think of these more, even though they're layers, more as overlays. Um, so we have just absolutely wonderful stuff like cell phone coverage. So if you're going out into an area, knowing uh, if you're likely to have reception, it's really nice. If you wanna shoot some night sky images, being able to see this over top of all of your uh, existing maps with the light pollution layer and then being able to see a visual of course you have uh, other apps for this but being able to see it all in one place is really nice so we have that for precipitation and snow and then if you're flying drones or if you're just wondering about permits you should probably know if you're entering into a wilderness area or not sometimes you do have uh, contour lines built into the maps like this one does uh, at other times you might have a map without uh, contour lines and in that case so for instance this is a, a satellite map here and let's say that I, I i like the satellite imagery but i'd like to see contour lines you can flip this on and it just overlays that and you can set the opacity to whatever uh, you like so this is really really useful and then I have a series of maps. And the one thing you'll notice here is the US hydrography. So this is very similar to the water feature that I had in Google Earth and uh, very, very useful. So you'll see in some cases there are already built within the map a, a line here. And in other cases, it will identify uh, new waterways. Let's try it here. And you can see uh, the existing map has all these uh, wonderful lakes along the PCT, but what it doesn't have are all these mist creeks, inlets and outlets from these lakes. And these are gonna be potential for waterfalls, especially if we combine that with a, uh, a steep slope. And so, you know, it's also really important to know if you're passing along the PCT here, you probably have a chance to refill your water here and potentially some nice stream crossings to, uh, to photograph. So I almost always leave this on. It uh, is not very disruptive to the map and adds a lot of value. And then for just seeing things at a high level, Gaia has a number of wonderful maps. I think the Gaia Topo, Gaia Overland, they're both great. And so when I go out into the back country, I will download this because it has wonderful labeling and has a lot of the popular routes already loaded. And then um, if I want to see some satellite imagery, I have a few different option. Um, there's the satellite with labels, which actually doesn't have labels, but uh, has some really good satellite imagery. And then um, this tends to be sort of uh, summer season. And then if we want to see more recent, I will switch over to the world imagery. And this tends to be a little bit more recent. So in our case, it's April. There's still a little bit more snow in areas uh, where there is not uh, in the summer with the other map. And then, yeah, just for variety, I'll switch over to this one. Now this satellite image already has topo lines built into it. So it can be a little bit distracting, but if you want it all in one, then you have that. So typically the way that I'll roll is I'll have uh, all of these layers sort of set down to um, zero opacity. That way I can just toggle them on and off and lay them, layer them in if I want. Uh, just so that they're not very distracting, but maybe I can still see them and then I can turn them off to get them out of the way and focus on navigating with the primary features of either 
uh, the Gaia topo map or a basic satellite map. So that is the uh, the gist of it. There's so much more to play around with. There's a lot more. You can import custom maps into this, custom layers. So there's it's just really amazing. The next thing that we want to take a look at is uh, overlays. And overlays are all the things that you have brought into Gaia from somewhere else. Now, Gaia does have a number of public tracks that they allow you to see. So this is going to be... Um, uh, situations where you know there's it's a pretty common popular route and when you do that sometimes you have to zoom in to see those sometimes you have to zoom out let's see here right now it's not identifying it might be a little bit of a lag but if you turn them on and you're you're diving into an area it will be really helpful to see so here we go turn them on and off and then what happens is when you hover over them they they kind of pop out and you can click on one of those and choose to, uh, so you can see there's a couple tracks. Now it's not as curated and as nice as all trails, but uh, it is data nonetheless, and you can choose to click on it and add it. So if for whatever reason you wanted to add this to your map, you can you could do that. You can save it, you can duplicate it. So really nice that that's built in. I tend not to do that though. I tend to leave those off just for clarity. And what I do is I import my, my maps from the ones that I want from all trails. And so you can see if I turn that on, this lights up like a pack of Skittles. I've got all kinds of uh, tracks and routes saved. And then if I turn on my waypoints, you will see this will light up like a Christmas tree. And that's because these are all my saved waypoints. And um, you know, if you click on any of these, you can see what it is in this case it's an unnamed waterfall and so if you imagine that we're going to a certain area having all of these already identified as potential shooting locations or potential areas of interest allows me to hit the ground running and really feel like i have a good sense of the conditions and the elements that i might come across and of course you can label all of these so that they come on and off and uh yeah you can also create uh a areas that you choose to download for later. And we will switch over to the phone to actually show you the most important part of this, which is taking all of this with you when you're, uh, when you're leaving with your phone. But before we do that, the last thing I want to talk about is just importing data. You can import data from pretty much anywhere and it accepts a lot of different formats. But since we just created that good comp spot in Google earth, let's just import that. So we'll go ahead and pull this up. And there is our good comp spot. We had uh, the uh, that we were looking at in Google Earth. So you can pull this in. And then one of the really nice things is you can add imagery. So under the open details page, you can come here and add photos. So one of the things I'll typically do is add photos and shots from Google Earth. And then if there are other inspirational photos from the area that I like, either you know from social media or from Google, I might load those as well as potential ideas. And so that's a really, really nice feature. You can take these photos with you in the backcountry to remind yourself why you saved the waypoint, why you might want to come back to it. It's just absolutely great feature. As soon as you add them, they're automatically saved and then synced to your device. So that is Gaia GPS on the desktop. Now we'll switch over to Gaia on your mobile device. Now we are in the mobile app version of Gaia GPS. In this case, we're on Android, but I imagine the iOS version is pretty similar. So I've navigated over to the area that we were looking at in Gaia. And if you're not seeing any of your waypoints, you can simply click down here in the bottom left to the layers. And then from here, you want to pull up your map overlays. And then from there, you can select your waypoints and your tracks if you have any loaded. So in our case, we had the uh, Solduck Falls sort of loop here. And then we have our good comp potential uh, right here as we were looking at uh, Mount Fitzhenry. And we obviously need a way to get there. So uh, because I haven't downloaded uh, any of the, uh, the maps um, specifically from something like all trails we can look here for public track so again if you go into the layers under map overlays if you have your public tracks down here on you'll see these little uh, lightly shaded areas 
and it does look like uh, one of these will lead at least somewhat close to the Cary Glacier. And so I can click on that. And when I do that, it pulls up this nice route. The route even has some pictures to it, uh, very dramatic views. So this is great. We can see an elevation profile, so very similar to the uh, information we saw in the other apps. And I want to save this offline. So now I've saved that to my own tracks. We can come down and now that's here, it's in a color. And so I'll be able to uh, come in uh, via this first loop, connect here, and then um, make our way over to uh, the, you can see here there's a few photos, and then over to this new area that we want to potentially explore. We'll have to potentially map a route, and that's something that we can do in here as well. We can create a route. But for today, I just wanna show um, the idea of downloading this area for later. So let's say I wanna go ahead and download this whole area uh, because a significant portion of this is probably offline. And again, that's something we can check. Let's check that. So we will go to the layers and drag the cell coverage all the way up. Now we can see here, we should have actually some spotty coverage. I tend to, to uh, experience that when it is uh, purple, that it's good for calls, but not good for data. And in that case, we won't be able to retrieve any of this information and it's good practice in general to download this stuff. So um, we'll toggle that off. And what we can do now is save an area. So here in the top right, you'll see save offline maps. And this is where you can draw out a custom area um, you had ten, generally have the tendency to draw the biggest map that you can, but you probably don't want to do that because pretty quickly you fill up the space on your phone. And you can see here, we are already kind of maxing out um, some of the coverage. So I know I already have good coverage there and I want to make sure I have a little bit of overlap. And this is what is really a standout feature compared to all trails. With all trails, you can download just the track itself and it downloads the area around it. But with Gaia, you can download anything that you want, including all of your saved waypoints. So we will go ahead and click next. And this is where you can choose all the layers. Um, in my case, I want to be pretty selective. So I'm not worried about that. I do want one um, Gaia sort of topo and one uh, satellite. So I'll leave these first two and toggle the rest of these off, especially the satellite images and toggle all these off. Oh, that one's the standard, sorry. And then down here, you'll see include offline route data and include 3D maps. That can be really nice. Now, again, you probably will want to do high, but you'll notice pretty quickly that any of your satellite maps will be tremendously big and will be far bigger than uh, what Gaia recommends. And so I've found that actually medium is, is enough. If it is a critical area where you really want to download a high resolution, um, you can do that for... Uh, the topo map so you could come over here and do a high download that and then come back and do another download for the uh, satellite imagery that you have so I'll just go ahead and select medium next and then you can label it so this would be trip to Fitzhenry and we are off and now you'll notice that that area that uh, area is being downloaded and is already downloaded onto the device. So we are good to go. We could turn off our cell phone service and still have access to all that work that we've done so far. With Gaia, I've got the trails, the terrain, and offline access. But when it comes to finding peak fall colors or those fleeting wildflower blooms, I turn to a community that's totally changed how I scout locations. There's nothing better than being there in person, boots on the ground. Many areas we photograph in the Pacific Northwest change dramatically through the seasons. Some areas are only accessible during certain periods of time, certain months, and some of the wildflower blooms only last just a few weeks. Those bloom times change yearly by as much as a month or more, making timing a trip for the ideal conditions pretty challenging. Even within the same region, I've noticed that on one side of a canyon, plants will bloom at one time and on the other side it might be three weeks later based on the elevation, sun exposure, and some other variables. 
I used to scour local hiking group pages on Facebook. And while this can definitely be a good source, I found a pretty hit or miss for focusing on the things that matter to landscape photographers. Now I turn to iNaturalist. It already has a big following with macro photographers, but it's also great for scouting flowers. Here's how I use it. Okay, iNaturalist. The primary way that I use this is to search an area for either wildflower or mushrooms, or in some cases for little critters for macro photography. Let's say that we wanted to go to the Rowena Crest area in the close to the Dalles in the Columbia River Gorge. It is the end of April here and the wildflowers should be blooming, but let's say we want to check. We can search here for the Dalles and there's the Rowena area, which is just outside of the Dalles. And what we can do here is do a redo search and map and that'll bring up uh, this area. You can customize it if you know you want to go to a specific area pretty close to there. What you're seeing here are all these different observations from the community and over on the right here is a, a list view. We can get a lot more focused and you can see here that somebody's identified a balsam root from just three hours ago and it looks like it's in prime condition but that we want to see more of that. We want to see more confirmation so you simply can uh, search. And now this brings up all of the observations of balsam roots. You can also use filters if you want to uh, narrow down things a little bit further and one of the great things about this is um, of course you can use it to search live but you can also search history so you can look back at uh, different months in different years and that will allow you to see what typically blooms during a certain season so this is really good if you have a trip coming up and you want to plan around the best bloom times so you would just set in a, a month april and may and see when the most observations were. But here you can see there's a lot of little critters and macro subjects, as well as flora and fauna. So we have all kinds of things, but what we can also do is sort by date. So we only see the most recent. What I'm looking for through the list view is more of the wider scenes to see what the type of spread is. And so you can click on that and see from just yesterday in the area that I'm looking to go just right across the river, uh, we have some pretty nice blooms happening right now. So it looks like it's sort of prime time and we could hone in on the specific area by going back, going into the Rowena area. I'd like to explore, let's say up here on the plateau and we'll redo the search in the map. And now we're only seeing photos within the map view, which is great. We can see that they've been blooming since the beginning of the month. And so they typically bloom for about a month or so could be a little bit longer and they are still going. So it, it's probably time to, to run down there if you haven't already and, and uh, try to make the most of it this year, but an absolutely amazing app and something I think a lot of landscape photographers are not familiar with. Okay, so I know when to go and where, but the weather can still make or break the trip. Windy is hands down the best weather app I've used and I've used a lot of them. It would take a very long time to show all the features of this amazing app, so I'm just going to double click on a few standouts I use over and over again for planning out my landscape photography, starting with the obvious, wind. Okay, here we are in Windy, and what better way to start off than with wind itself? I love seeing wind, these little animations, and one thing that's really nice to be able to do is to click on the altitude and see wind at different elevations, you can see if the jet streams are bringing in any major systems in or out of the area. And besides, it's just uh, visually mesmerizing. So what you'll see over here are my favorites. There are many more layers, but I will go through a few of the ones that I really enjoy. You'll also notice that there is a time slider. You can hit play to play this over time. You can also drag this to a very specific time and you will see it update. What you're seeing here is the wind speed and that's because we have the forecasted weather. You can also turn on favorites, which you can use to save favorite locations. And so I have Mount Rainier Sunrise, for instance, saved here and 
Down below that, you can see the different weather models, and this is a really amazing feature that they surface to you. This type of data isn't always available to consumer weather apps, where we can see the European model, the North American model, uh, the GFS, most of the, the weather apps use in the United States, GFS, and then a few of these newer models uh, have some specific use cases. Some of them are really good in mountains, but they, they, they don't look that far out. Anyway, what makes this really special is being able to compare multiple forecasts. Let's say that we want to look at medium clouds. We can flip between the models and see, wow, that's, that's a big difference. Let's go over to the GFS. Okay, so we can see here that there's not a lot of agreement, even just for local time. So this isn't giving me a lot of confidence. Another way to view this is to click on an area and forecast for this location. And that brings up the more detailed time slider you can compare. And so if you click compare, you're able to now see all of those weather models overlaid on top of one another. And this is a way to get great confidence. You could create your own average of the five. And again, some of them run out of room pretty quickly, like the NAM. One other feature that's really nice is the Meteogram. So this is like Meteo Blue and that it allows you to visualize the clouds and the cloud cover. So we do have these separate high, medium, and low clouds as well as fog layers saved as my favorites. But this is gonna show you them all at once as well as precipitation, the weather, the wind. You can save your favorite layers by coming over here and choosing arrange layers. And then you just simply drag and drop. These are my favorites, fog. Cloud base will tell you the lowest point of the fog. So this is great if you want to know if you're gonna be able to see a mountain peak. So for example, we can just select this and um, it looks like this is in feet. So we have a little legend down here. So we are at around 1400 feet, which means that if we are below 1400 feet, we are most likely not seeing the mountain. Okay, and that brings me to a wonderful way to confirm all of this, and that is the webcams. I use this all the time to either confirm a forecast or just to simply glance at an area. I've also saved my favorite webcams so that I can quick link to them uh, for certain areas and just check. So for instance, we could go ahead and click on the one closest here and see what the weather was looking like today. So this is gonna be the last 24 hours. You can go back further than that. It looks like they got some, some new snow and then it kind of blocked in, but this is an absolutely great way uh, to learn. I use this when I did a trip to uh, Glacier National Park and I was back and forth from the east to the west side of the park. There isn't a lot of cell phone reception there, but when you make it to the other side, you have just enough to check the webcams and see if you are in the right spot. When you're checking weather real time, it's sort of too slow and the webcams just give you that immediate confirmation. Now with the weather on our side and our maps downloaded, we're ready to go. So there you have it. These apps and strategies help me stack the deck to maximize my time in nature. Hopefully this video has added a few more arrows in your quiver so you feel motivated to put in the prep work for better results and inspired and equipped to seek out lesser known locations. All five of the apps are available on web, Android, or iOS, and each has a free version. So you can try them out, see if you need any of the premium features. Each of these apps could be a video in and of itself. So let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a dedicated deep dive video on any of these apps. I'm also curious to hear what apps or hacks you use to plan if you care to share them in the comments. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.